vacation from where we've been, just a little bit. Uh, the last few Sundays that we've been studying, we've been up in this area. Oh, get the right river here. We've been in that Jezreel Valley, and we've been back and forth between Mount Carmel and, and his tour, and Shunem, which was back down about in here somewhere. So we had the, the Shunammite woman who made room in her home for Elisha to stay in. Uh, you remember the we had the, the previous to that was the the woman who was the widow of one of the prophets who had the oil the miracle of the oil, and then somewhere in there that didn't give us a location we had the two miracles, one of the pot of uh, stew that would, had the poisonous vegetables in it made edible by the addition of the meal and the other one was the, the offering of bread and grain that was multiplied to feed a hundred of the prophets so we've been through those little vignettes of, of miracles that were done and and uh, puzzled over why with the few words that God had to share with us he stuck those in there and I bet you I'm still puzzled but we've tried to draw some lessons from them but Today we start one that's more famous, more well known than probably a lot of the miracles in the Old Testament, and that's of Naaman the Syrian, who uh, was healed of leprosy. So today we'll be moving to Samaria, which is right there, south of the Jezreel Valley. Over there's a mountain range, if you will, here there's a pass, but there's a hills there, and of course hills here. And if you remember, Samaria was the hill of Samar that was purchased by the king of Israel to establish a uh, more defensible capital city. So we looked at pictures last time which have since been lost in our shuffle and computer crashes and Kathy's multitudinous slides and things she's got with, we weren't able to fish them out. Um, but, you remember, it looks like this little hill and it's surrounded by kind of a flat area with the mountains on all the sides. So the enemy comes in, you can see him coming. And so they built this up as the capital city and as the, a defensible place to hold off an invasion. So, wow, close up. So there it is, out there all by its little self right out there. And it's important to know where it is in relation to the rest of the world because as this man Naaman is coming from Syria uh, you need to know that that's over this way and he's coming down and across the Jordan and then working his way up and over on wherever the highways were over this town and uh, it's going to play into what takes place in it realizing where that town is in relationship to uh, the place he comes from and where he travels as he goes through the story. So without a whole lot more, let's jump into the story in uh, chapter 5 and read through at least a portion of it here and uh, see how we can sort it out. Or if we can sort it out, maybe is a better question. So chapter 1, uh, or verse 1 of chapter 5, 2 Kings. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and highly respected, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. The man was also a valiant warrior, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, then he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. Wouldn't you like to get a letter like that? He did, too. And it came about when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, 
Am I God to kill and make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. And it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let's stop right there for a moment, back up the truck a little bit, and try to look at this guy, Naaman, Naaman, I don't know how you pronounce his name. Naaman's what I've always heard it, so that's what we use today, because it's one I can remember, and I won't get too confused. But as, as you look at him, there's some things we need to notice about this guy as the story gets set up. Because remember, we've got to look at it from several ways. We want to look at it from the perspective of the people and the time that it took place. And why would God record it for the nation of Israel and the situation they're in? And we know that this is the northern tribes. It's the ones that broke away from Judah. The ones that have placed the golden calves as strategic places to worship to pull people away from Jerusalem, away from their, their religion, the faith that they've been taught, with just enough to make it look familiar, but to draw them away. And also the place where uh, the worship of Baal is there, the worship of Ashtaroth has been pushed, and those things are out there. Jezebel is still in the land. Uh, all that is still going on. So the nation is really in moral and spiritual decline, even though the economics and the health of the nation economically has been up and down. There are sometimes ones that have been actually fairly good. But here is a nation that's really struggling, and a leader that has seen great things happen. He has seen this very prophet rescue them from Moab in their attack down there. And so he's seen great things happen for him, and yet here is a guy that's really going to be struggling when he gets this letter. So here's a nation that's really in a mess. And here's this story that pops up of this guy with this dread disease that is healed. And the first thing you've got to notice is, why isn't it a Jew? It's not a Jewish guy. It's a Syrian. Why would God choose to put a story in his word about somebody that's not of the nation of Israel. Why would it be there? What's he trying to tell the nation? What was their assignment when they were placed in the land? He should have us about who God was. They were to be the ones that would bring blessing on the whole world, weren't they? They were to be the channel of the truth. They were to be the channel of the word to all the nations out there. And all the nations are out there, and they're all Hold up down here. They're sucking in the nations, all right, but only Baal and Ashtaroth and all the stuff that you wouldn't want to suck in. They're pulling all that in just fine. But they aren't being the, the light to the world. And so here God takes this guy out there and brings him in. And it's really interesting that he brings this individual. It makes you think of uh, the widow that Elijah stayed with and the miracle of raising her son, and it's even mentioned by the Lord as a way of chastisement of the Jews in his time, and they wanted to go throw him over a cliff for it. He says it wasn't a Jewish person. There were lots of women who lost children, and only one was raised, and it wasn't a Jewish woman. So it's about where faith is. So it's interesting that this Naaman if you go into Leviticus 13 and 14, one of your favorite chapters in the Word, I am sure, it's right there in that riveting stuff where it all talks about the details of the law and everything. It tells you all about leprosy, how to identify it, how to find it, all this sort of thing. And one of the things that you will pick up out of those grueling details is that it's not a good thing to have. In the nation of Israel particularly, it was not a good thing to have. Because not only did you have this disease, but unlike this captain in the military, you don't even have a job. In fact, you are thrust out of the city, you're unclean, you're placed outside of the nation, outside of the walls, outside of the circles, the tents, whatever you want to call it. But you are thrust out from the presence of the nation. 
And there's a reason for that when you come to leprosy, that it's not only is it this dread disease, it's an illustration to people what, of our problem. It's an illustration consistently used through scripture of sin and what it does to us as human beings and how it affects us not only physically, but in our relationship with God. It's, you put the temple as the illustration of the presence of God, and it was actually the presence of God in that time when the Shekinah glory dwelt there. So there is the place we want to be, if you will, and as a leper, you are as far out as you can get. You're completely ruined. You're not even in the city. You can't come make an offering. You are outside the city. You're untouchable. And the only thing you can do is go about with that hooded garment, shouting out to all those who come by, unclean, unclean, untouchable. And differently, in Syria, this man is the captain of the army of the king of Syria. So he is a guy that still has an important place, even though this disease has come upon him. He is number two in the nation. If you understand him as the chief of the, or the joint chiefs of staff, he's the head guy. He is the head military man. He's number two to the king. And that is his job. He is greatly respected. And it's the reason it says he was a great man with his master. So the king thinks a lot of him. So he has a high place politically and militarily. And uh, it says he is highly respected. And in fact, it's interesting. I pulled this let me pull back on page up here if I can find it. His name actually has a, a meaning. It is uh, similar to the Hebrew verb na'em, to be delightful, pleasant, beautiful. It has the idea of gracious or well-formed. The concept would be if that makes, if that works, if that really is in the idea of naming children something that tells you about them as a person or their character. He was probably very good looking before he got this leprosy. So just his name tells you that he's one that stood out. He was probably handsome, he was rugged, he was tough, he was brave, he was successful. He was everything that you would want to be highly respected in his nation. And interestingly enough, this unbelieving heathen man had been used, it says, by the Lord to have victory for Syria. And you go, why would God do that? Well, what's he going to use Syria for? He's using Syria as one of the tools to try to bring the nation of Israel around to their senses. And in order for them to do that, they have to be successful as a nation. And he had to be successful. And one of the things that they did was send raiding parties into Israel. He was successful in doing that, and we know that because his wife had a servant girl who was a product of one of those raids, and they brought her back as a slave, and she served his wife. So here all the politics, all this stuff's going together, and God says here that God was the one who sponsored and used that. He's setting this whole thing up, not only for Naaman, not only for the king of Israel, but it's, here's this great illustration that's recorded for us. God was setting this up so we could all get a picture of what he wants us to know about things that we can't see. And, and the Jews, okay. I've been sitting here reminded how much I interrupt you or not. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Uh, they look down their noses at anybody that's not a Jew. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, so, so no matter how glorious so this guy is and good looking, he's still not a Jew he's and still beneath not a their Jew. feet. And isn't that the whole purpose that God wants us to spread the word even to those that we deem unworthy? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, this is like double indemnity for him because he's not only a Gentile, he's one that has the untouchable disease. He has leprosy. So it's double whammy against him from their perspective. You know. And yet it's interesting that this is the one that God picks out and says, I'm going to call this guy. 
So before we go on, we know that he's a leper. Anybody here had leprosy know somebody that does? Yeah, it's everywhere, right? Well, it's Hansen's disease is uh, what it's called. But just to get you an idea a little bit of what it looks like and what it does, I, I want to read for you a couple descriptions of leprosy. And then actually in the scriptures was the, the Greek word that the word leprosy comes from is leprae, is, uh, means to peel off in scales. And so that's the word that's used. And it actually is used of a number of diseases like psoriasis and other things. And there were various kinds, some worse than others. But there's this one uh, that probably is in view most of the time when you talk about the, the really dangerous one. Uh, there's a more benign one. But the leprotomous type is the one that was life-changing. As this form begins to spread, portions of the eyebrow may disappear, and then spongy tumor-like swellings appear on the face and body. The disease is systemic and involves the internal organs as well. It is deep-seated in the bones, joints, and marrow of the body, resulting in the deterioration of the tissues between the bones. The results are deformity, loss of feeling in the appendages, and in the fingers and toes eventually falling off. The form is incurable and lasts until the victim finally dies, often by the invasion of other diseases because of the weakened condition. They may live for 20 or 30 years in this miserable condition. Now, if you can imagine that, it's just hard to... And this thing was feared. It's a bacterial uh, disease. Uh, there's other less severe types that often can uh, appear similar to begin with, but uh, actually in, they have an end to them and therefore the reason for when you read in Leviticus 13 and 14 about how you can come in and be examined and then watched over time and if it shows that it doesn't turn into this, then you can be declared clean and, and you can go your way. But when you had this, there was no coming back. You just didn't do that. And that's why when Jesus healed the leper, he would have come into the temple to be examined, to be found clean. And if people knew him, if those priests knew him and this guy walked in, have been healed of this, man, I tell you what, there should have been bells, whistles, and sirens going off because nobody came back from this. You think in the dark ages when everything was so filthy, you read about you know how people went their whole lives and didn't take a bath or... Mm -hmm. Something you'd think leprosy would have really been rampant. It was serious, yeah. Well, that's why the leper colony on Hawaii is where they sent people, you know, because it was bacterial. You could catch it. You could get it from, imagine, the environment around you. I don't know. It didn't follow the epidemiology of the whole thing and all the, how, how it comes from. But anyway, this is a nasty disease. So this is what the guy has. This is what's coming on. It's beginning to eat away at his system, and obviously he had become so deformed and so drawn, and also his fingers and toes had not started falling off yet, but it was advanced enough that it was easily recognized, and uh, it was a death sentence, a miserable death sentence at that, 20, 30 years of going through this. This is awful. And God always draws the connection between this condition of man physically and the sin. So when you're going through this, I want you to recognize that the message he's trying to send to those folks in the nation of Israel is this is your condition, folks. This is You've sucked all this stuff. This disease is eating away at the inside of you as a nation. And there's a cure for it that he's going to present. And you guys, it's right there in the middle of you. The prophet has the cure. And the nation is unwilling to come. So... And the same is true of us. The, the, the picture of leprosy is a picture of what sin does to us. So when you read this, that's the parallel he wants to draw. So we have this young girl. The next person that's just passed by, but I want you to, she is something else. You can just, this is one of those little bit players that in Scripture that you can blow over and totally miss. But I want you to catch this. 
in verse 2. The Syrians had gone out in bands, those raiding bands, and they'd gone into Israel, and they had taken captive a little girl, a little girl. This is not a woman. This is a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Okay, put yourself in her shoes. You are a young child. Your town has been raided. Very likely, they didn't just go out and knock on your door and say, uh, I'm sorry, you need to come with us and load you in their little van and haul you off. They came into town and they slaughtered the men, the boys, and they took the women and girls captives and made them slaves. And they took everything else that was worth taking and they gutted the town and left. That was the whole point, was demoralize, discourage, and defeat the enemy by guerrilla warfare. Take them out. So that has been your experience. You've been ripped away from your family. You've been hauled off to this foreign place. And you've been sold or bartered or you were cute. And he says, I want her for my wife, to serve in my wife. Which is probably one of the better things that could have happened to you. But still... You're a long way from home. What are you thinking? What do you think about your God that you thought would protect you, that you were taught was watching over your nation, was protecting you? I think that, uh, that Naaman and his wife must have been very kind to her. And she loved to them. And it's, and it's, it's very possible that well having... Yeah. Because they were good to her. And consequently... Okay, that's very possible that, that Naaman and his wife, having got her and having been through all that, were very gracious and very kind to her and uh, made her almost one of the family, if you will, but still a servant because she obviously has some affection or something for her owner. Well, back to your question, I, I would think that the average person that doesn't have a lot of faith in God would think that he had abandoned if you, you know, were taken from your home. Yeah. You wouldn't think of, I mean, it would be very hard for a person that didn't have tremendous faith in God to feel any other ways. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be fitting, normal, you would even, for you, if you had been ripped out of your family and enslaved by the head of the army that destroyed your town and your family, and say, well, he's got leprosy, I guess that serves him right. It wouldn't be surprising, would it? But she, since she realized her good fortune and being kindly treated, she probably attributed that to God if she was raised in a family that had strong faith. I agree. I think she was in a family of those with strong faith, yeah. And God obviously chose her to be where she was at. And here's a young woman that... At a young age, a young girl that has enough of God's truth been planted in her that she recognizes that God's still with her where she's at in this really crazy situation. We can only imagine what it's all been through and how. And even with the love that these folks might have shared her, she's still a servant girl. And yet here she is, and and comment to her mistress in verse 3. I wish that my master, who she obviously cares about, was with the prophet who is in Samaria. Why? Because he would cure him. When did that happen? That she could count on and be confident that he would cure him? We don't have, I don't know how many lepers got healed by this guy. Elisha. But I don't read of any, and you would think that if there were lepers coming to his place like crazy and being healed of leprosy, that there would be some comment about it somewhere. That would make enough notice in the nation that, wow, there's a healing clinic down there. You ought to beat feet over there if you got... I mean, there were tons of lepers. This was a prevalent disease. Who would be listening to a little girl? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, Oh, my, we've got some men that got cured by them, so, you know, yeah. by this guy. And so I, you just sort of wonder. They really were desperate, willing to do anything, I guess. 
There's an interesting relationship there, and you have to wonder, what was their relationship? Why would the mistress listen to her? Something with her and her mistress, there was a relationship there of trust and there was something about the behavior of this young woman that engendered that trust. There's something about her character and her faith. Yeah, I, I, would, I would imagine that she probably exhibited her faith to that woman and to that man, probably talked about God. I mean, mm -hmm. otherwise, why would they have believed her yeah. about anything? You know, they had to see something in her that would make them believe that what she was saying was true. It was worth pursuing, yeah. Now this, I mean, you can all do a whole message on this young lady and try to figure out what it is. And of course, the, the obvious illustration that she is doing under, somewhat under duress, but she's doing what the nation was designed to do. That's what Israel was supposed to be out. Just going out and saying, this is what our God is and who He is and what He can do. Went out to, didn't have to sell it, you just had to proclaim it and live it. And here's this young girl. Oh yeah, I've got to stop for a minute. Young girl in the nation of Israel in a culture that said it's all about the boys. And time, it really bugs me sometimes that people say, oh, Christianity puts women down. Because when I go through the scriptures, I find over and over and over these women that are incredibly important and significant in a culture that fought against that. A culture that said, it's a man's world, you run the family, you run the show and everything. And here are all these women. And here's this young girl that's making a difference and doing what God called her to do. And it makes me wonder how mine says little girl. Yeah. Which... To me, that says even more than a young girl, because a young girl, I could think of somebody, you know, at that time, maybe 12 or older. Yeah. This says little girl. So we're, we're probably looking at somebody preteen. Yeah. Yeah. Really young. Really young. And she's got a testimony that her, her mistress says, I'm going to pass that on. And this Naaman thinks about it, and he starts percolating in his head. He goes, I'm going to follow that. And how did she know? She's been taught somewhere. Somebody taught her somewhere. She's been taught enough about whether it's the law or it's a very devout family. It starts early. It starts early. That if training is done, if kids have the information, they have the truth at an early age, they can make the right decisions later under really tough conditions. This is pretty impressive, this young woman. I think it's impressive that all of that in two verses, wow. Isn't that amazing where God I mean, sticks I, I in I get it off, you know, kilt to here, but if the, the Bible, every two verses, you, you, there's so much to, to learn. Yeah, isn't that amazing? And the hard part is stopping long enough to say, wait a minute. Yes. Uh, the hold the phone. What did that say? Uh, yeah, it's easy because you know the story. If you know the story, it's worse. Because you go, oh yeah, I remember that. Yep, yep, that's it. That's what happened. In fact, interestingly enough, all the commentators I read, very few mentioned too much about her. A couple of comments about that we've talked about here, but you'd think you'd have a whole big section. Of, wow, look at this girl. So go home and read it again and go, wow, look at this girl. interesting that they don't name her. Yeah, no name. She is simply. She's just a young girl. You know? God's chosen young girl. She'll, he knows who she is. She'll be anonymous till we get to heaven. You can say, who is that? Which one of you? <laughs> I want to know. Wow. And so she's confident. He would. Isn't he might or he could? Is he would? He would do it. He would cure him of his leprosy. And that kind of conviction, I think, is part of what got Naaman going. Well, we would. Okay. Now, you need to shift gears because now I'm going to take you to Naaman in his high office and everything, and he's going to run down to the king. And I want you to see this different kind of thinking. Here is, and this is the world we live in, in case you don't recognize it. Listen to this. Naaman went in and he told his master, 
saying, this is, thus and thus, this is what the little girl who was from the land of Israel told me. And he repeats the story. And the king goes, oh, right. I mean, he thinks the world of this guy. You can see it right here. No hesitation. The king of Syria said, you go now. And I will send a letter. Where? To the king. Because that's how you do it. This is international politics. You send down, it's in Israel. The king is in charge of everything. I'm in charge of things here, right? So I'm going to send this to the king. That's what we're going to do. I'll send a letter. And so Naaman packed up and departed. And here's what he took with him. He's got 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. And you go, eh. It's a boatload of silver and gold. And I struggled to find a modern breakdown of just, in our dollars, what it would be, because all my best commentators old day guys. And it wasn't worth near as much then as it is now. I'm, we're, we're probably looking at, if not millions, thousands of dollars. Big chunk of money. And then the changes of clothes, I, one commentator did share, I was going, huh? Ten pairs of clothes. No, it was changes of clothes. And when you went to a very fancy affair, one of the things that was in fashion, I guess, was that throughout the evening or day or whatever this thing was, kind of like your favorite singers when they do a big deal or whatever, you know, they come out and they got this dress on, and then they go change and they run back in and they have this outfit on, and then they do something and then they change and they come out with another outfit. Well, one of the things you would do is have all these changes of very fancy, very expensive silk and embellished clothing so you could impress everyone. So when throughout the, the affair, you would have all these fabulous costumes to wear. That's what we're talking about. So 10 sets of multiple clothes of impressive, expensive, nice looking stuff. So it's not taking 10 pair of skivvies and some... No, this is, no, this isn't packing your, this isn't traveling the way I do, you know, with an extra handkerchief. You know. No, we're talking about more than a pair of jeans, so uh, this is a big gift. So, how do you get things done? Contacts, you go to the big head guy, and you pay money. You got to earn your way. You want something like this? This is a serious deal. You stick your wealth behind it. You're going to buy this thing. You're going to get it that way. And so he trots down to Israel, all the way down to Samaria there, right there above Bethel and Shiloh, up, out there in the hill of Samar. Long ways. Long travel. Here comes from way up here, down, across, and over, long way, all the way over to Samaria. And you, yeah. You're rich. You can't buy salvation. You're rich. You can't buy it. You've got a disease, and you can't get rid of it. All this wealth, all this influence, all this power, and he's got leprosy. You can't get rid of it. But he's going to try to buy it. Well, and they're assuming that the king can force the prophet. Yeah. And and look at these two guys coming at it. They're going to run head on into each other and get nowhere. I just love this response of this king. This guy knows better. He knows the guy that can do miraculous things. In fact, later we'll see him sitting down and I don't know where in this this all took place, but he's sitting and talking to Gehazi, Elisha's servant, and Gehazi is doing his. Well, I'm so important. I'm telling you all about all the great things that Elisha's done. <laughs> and just eating it up. And so at some point that took place. Whether it's before or after this, I don't know. But he's got to know about this prophet Elisha. But this letter comes from the king to the king saying, Here's my servant. Please heal him. Here's the gift. Wouldn't you like to get that letter? That's just... So he brought the letter to the king of Israel saying, And now, as this letter comes to you, Behold, I love that, that sounds Bible biblical, doesn't it? Behold, I have sent my name and my servant to you that you may cure him of his leprosy. Thank you very much. Signed, King. And the guy goes, this is a plot. Did you hear that? He 
tears his robes. Does he tear his robes because he can't heal the guy? Well, yes and no. What is he really worried about? He's scared. It's a setup. He's scared to death. This is a setup. I sent this down, you, know, you fluff them all up. Oh, you great king. Here's my guy. Heal him. What if you don't? That's exactly what he says. He's sending word to me to cure a man of this leprosy? What is it? Does he think I'm a god to kill and to make alive? You see, that's the issue. You can take a dead man and make him alive. He says, I can't do that. That's how bad this disease was. That he was someone who could make that choice for someone. Says, but consider, I see he's seeking a quarrel against me. He's starting to try. He's trying to stir up trouble. He's going to start with this. Well, I sent this guy down. You wouldn't heal him. All right. Well, no more, Mr. Nice Guy. We're going to come down and take the nation by force. I mean, he just—he's grasping at straws. Why in the world would anybody send to him, looking to be healed of leprosy? And when you think about it, though. Where else would you go? What's the nation of Israel supposed to have? They're supposed to have the keys to life. And the king ought to be the one closest to the prophets. To the He lived next door to the temple at one time. Jesus hasn't been born yet, though. He hasn't, but the temple was right there in Jerusalem, and it spoke about him every sacrifice, every day, over and over again. And over again, the sacrifice was there. And they should have known that. That here's the answer, the key to life is here. You should send to the king, and he ought to be able to point you right to it. And he doesn't have the foggiest idea of what to do. I love Elisha's response. Verse 8. It just happened. I want you to notice things in the Bible just happened. Did you see that? It just happened. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king had torn his clothes. That sounds funny. Jeez, he ripped his clothes and it got out all over the kingdom. That's like living in Bickleton. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we made the waves the other day. We, just to, no extra charge. We got to call some folks that live way over halfway to Cleveland. We're sitting on their deck the other morning. I started up two of our trucks early in the morning. Because they have to build air. It takes a long time. These old Cummins engines, you know what they look like when you first start them up? Man, it looks like your building's on fire. I had two. One was inside and one was outside. It was just a nice little breeze. And they knew that Juris's farm just went up. Because it went on for like 20 minutes. Uh, oh, man. So, it's like this, you know. Gee, Tori's clothes, everybody in town knows. Somehow the word got out that this letter has come and the king is distraught and what am I going to do? This guy wants to be healed from leprosy. This is nuts. And Elisha says, send him to me. Send him to me. The king didn't seek out Elisha. The king did not seek Elisha offers his services. He says, you come to me and you know why you should come to me? He shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. This guy's going to know that there's a prophet in Israel. There's a one who is connected to God in Israel. Why did he say there's a prophet? There's a prophet. There's one who can tell you about God. There's one who can lead you to God in Israel. Man, we're running out of time. I was hoping to get a little farther than this, but then you knew better than that. <laughs> I just want to leave you with one last little thing here, because we'll pick it up next time. But you've got to see Naaman's reaction. I mean, he's probably excited. Because he finally got through the red tape, and folks are now going to send him the right way of the dead end at the king's palace for a few days there. You thought all hope was lost. And word came to you saying, there's a prophet in Samaria. Go down to his house. And I imagine it's like going down to some little house in the back streets of Mapton. It has got to be an unassuming little out of the way spot that this prophet lived. And here comes the entourage. This is, you know, the head military guy with his chariot, probably gold plated, 
everything else, beautiful horses, and all his attendants that rode with him, the one that drove his chariot, and the ones that followed the footman, and how many other, the security guard, maybe uh, multiple chariots. Can you imagine winding through Mapton with something like that? All the black cars with flags, you know, flying in the wind sort of thing, the diplomatic route. I mean, this is a big deal. Come rolling down to his house with all this thing. And he stood at the doorway of Elisha, standing outside the door with all this stuff. And the flags are flying, and the horses snorting, and everybody there. Man, he's expecting this is going to be a big deal. I'll leave you right there. You can read for yourself how this all turns out, and we'll pick it up next time. Let's close. Father, we thank you for our time this morning as we begin to dig into this story of Elisha and this man uh, stricken with this awful disease that we know as leprosy. Father, um, it's easy to get into the story and imagine some of this stuff and how amazing it all was and the spectacle of it all and for us to forget that this is an illustration for us of, of our condition that we are uh, stricken with this disease of sin and there's just no way to remove it and it's not something that we just wear on the skin that's a, a little outside lesion that looks bad it's a uh, insidious disease that goes throughout our system and slowly eats away at everything that holds us physically together and spiritually together and, and ultimately unchecked will lead to our destruction. Father, so many of us are out trying to work our way to deal with this effort and certainly you called upon us to uh, change our attitudes and our hearts and to step away from sin as those who are believers. But we forget those who are unbelievers, they're sold in that slave market. They are slaves to it. They have no way out unless they're purchased from the outside by the one who shed his blood on their behalf. Father, help us to appreciate what it costs the Savior to take us away from this dread disease. Help us, Father, to uh, learn to flee the remnants of that that still live within us as uh, those who are not yet glorified. Help us to learn how to use uh, God's power provided for us through the power of the Holy Spirit to uh, learn to live a life that would reflect Christ. That we might be like this young girl, living in a place far from home, far from her land and her family and her nation, and yet faithful, living uh, empowered by you in a way that makes an impact in this man's life and is recorded for all eternity in your word. Father, help us to live a life like that. Be willing to be uh, your voice, your, uh, your person that points people to the truth, uh, that they might uh, be cured of the disease that plagues them. Thank you, Father, for the time to uh, look at this story. Help us to see it as more than just a story, but one that, that teaches us uh, about you and about your grace and how much you love us. We thank you, Jesus Christ.